Have you ever played a brilliancy that was marred by one little detail that you didn't win it in the end? Have you ever played a move so beautiful that while you were playing the game, you were thinking about the letter you were going to write to your grandmother about it later? Have you ever had doubled rooks on the seventh in a position so completely dominating and failed to win the game in the end? I have to all of those. And uh, if you have, then you're in good company because today this is exactly what happened to Grandmaster Vidit, who is currently in first place in the Prague Masters, but had a tough day today. And uh, together, we're going to be looking at his round eight game today, uh, in which he played brilliantly, 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 and then lost. And this will be a wild, instructive, and relatable heartbreak for most of us. Um, we're going to take you back to the beginning, and we're also going to quickly introduce his opponent, Grandmaster David Navarra, who is going to be the foil in this game, playing black against him, and uh, putting up uh, a pretty strong defense at some points in this game, which uh, certainly helps you to not convert. Is uh, Sometimes we don't think about our opponent and we don't acknowledge the uh, effort that they've put into defending. But often your opponent defending well is part of why you fail to convert a position that, that's otherwise uh, so winning that you can't believe you didn't convert it. Um, so here we go. Uh, it starts out as a Queens Indian and uh, a three variation, Petrosian variation, favored by Kasparov long ago. But this move, bishop f4, is a bit unusual to me. And uh, I'm used to knight c3 being the point of a3 because you've prevented uh, bishop to b4. But a3 also coordinates somewhat well with bishop f4 because one of the downsides of some early bishop f4 and bishop g5 lines in queen pawn openings is your opponent being able to get some kind of counterplay on the diagonal that your bishop is no longer defending. So a3 and bishop f4 is very unusual to me, but it does make some sense. And we quickly get to this position here. <coughs> Black Navarra has opened up his bishop, which is nice. Um, he's prepared that white is soon going to try and take over the center. And uh, hopefully that bishop will be well placed in that case. So here comes Vidit grabbing a bunch of space. And I'm completely out of positions that I'm super familiar with by now. Um, the bishop on g3 is odd in this situation. Black going to go trade it off is slightly odd. He could have also done it through e4 with sort of the same thing. So it's an unusual position. Um, but uh, be that as it may, we can see a couple main features here before we get into the next sequence that uh, was pretty decisive for where this game went. Um, white has the space advantage off of this e5 pawn, but black has a good bishop and seemingly pretty good chances to counter white center with the move c5, maybe trade his c pawn for the d pawn, and reduce black's cramp, and most importantly open up files in the center of the board, which would distract white from a potential kingside attack. The pawn on e5 is kind of what signals that, hey, black doesn't have as much room for pieces on the king side, so maybe white's going to attack his king when it goes there. So c5 is a natural plan for black to use to counter that. Um, you know, the bishop may be on an unusual square, but those factors are still consistent and recognizable to anybody who's played a bunch of queen pawn games in their life. So, <clears throat> so from here, there's going to be a couple logical development moves. Um, sometimes you'd see the bishop on d3, if white's looking for the kingside attack, right? Here, by putting the bishop on c4, I think that Vidit is saying that if black plays the move c5, which they didn't play, uh, he would like to advance d5 and have his bishop in good position to uh, fight for the d5 square and possibly be on an open diagonal later when pawns get traded on this diagonal. <clears throat> now, in this position, uh, Grandmaster Navarra plays a hideous move, a heinous move, a reprehensible move, a barely forgivable move, though Vidit will eventually forgive him later in this game. He plays the move a6. I struggle to understand what he was doing with this move other than waving a red flag in Vidit's face saying like, hey, if I play some random, ugly, horrible, tempo-losing move in the opening, can you punish me? What do you got? Um, 
I could imagine that it might be involved with the idea of playing c5. And basically, if I go back to playing the move c5 for you and d5 from white, in some cases, as black, you want to be able to play b5 in response to d5 from white and use your b pawn by fighting against white's bishop or knight to help black gain control of the d5 square. However, honestly here, even if black plays a6 and c5, I hardly see how the move b5 would be good enough to help him fight for this d5 square in this position with e6 hanging and d6 coming in. I just, I, I don't see how even the move a6 really threatens to play c5 and then d5. So to me, it just looks like a bad move, like sort of testing the limits or provoking the opponent to see what they're going to do. Well, at first, what they're going to do is play some extremely instructive chess. So Vidit at first is going to show us how to punish uh, Navarra's poor opening play. Um, and he's going to play just d5 himself without even giving time for c5. Um, <clears throat> Now, this puts a lot of uh, pressure on Navarra because it's going to trade off the e6 pawn most likely. It's going to um, give him the possibility of worrying about the move e6 from white. And it's probably going to leave black with a weak square on d5 that a white piece is going to outpost in. So, um, for example, e takes d5 was played. Bishop takes d5 was played. Here, um, Navarra played knight takes g3, which we'll see in a second. But let's say he trades on d5. I think Vidic could put his queen on d5 instead of the knight, um, even though that looks like a great square for a knight. And the point being, his queen's going to get into a weak light square on c6. Then with a rook on d1, he'll probably also put the knight on d5. And I just want to put this on the board for you guys for a second so you can see how black is a little bit weak or tender on the light squares, right? It's hard to keep the white pieces out of d5. It's, it's hard to get the queen out of c6. Uh, especially with the queen on c6, it's hard to get the knight out of d5. Those pieces start to apply pressure. Plus, white has the idea of e6, right, with more attacks against light squares. So this would be a very difficult-looking position for um, Navarra to try and defend, especially since any knight move here is going to be answered by queen c6 check. And, like, let's say you want to go through c5 or f8 to try and bring the knight to a good square on e6 and stop e6 from white. If queen c6 check is played... You can't play queen d7 because of the rook hanging. So something bad has to happen to black from here, right? Either moving the king and then, you know, rook to d1 or bringing the knight back and then again, rook d1 or castle's queenside with immense pressure. So I think we can see, hopefully, the weakness of black's light squares there. So, <clears throat> so black traded on g3 and then played another terrible move, c6. Um, locking in his bishop instead of trading it, and perhaps having no idea what Vidit was going to do. Uh, the best move for black, I'm pretty sure, would be to play knight c5, introducing his queen and his knight into the fight for the light squares, and black can continue struggling along in this game. I think white's a bit, is comfortably better with a nice pawn here, and rook on the h file, and knight's in good position. But um, black can definitely still fight despite the move a6. So if you're wondering how bad was a6, not bad enough to just directly lose the game. But it was basically one second mistake away from losing the game. Because with this move c6, it is all but over when Vidit smashes him with bishop takes f7. I want to give Vidit a lot of credit here because he's going to lose credit a little bit later in the game. And also because he deserves it. This move is not necessarily like so obvious to to every player this that this sacrifice is going to be good even if you notice bishop f7 even if you're looking to strike on the light squares and have that feeling the black's light squares are weak have that feeling that black has you know provoked you with a6 and c6 and you want to punish him you might still not be sure that this move is good enough because what's the follow-up after king takes f7 he's going to play e6 to drag the king further out again not the only move not the most obvious um move because the king can take it and still what's the follow-up you can play queen b3 you can play queen a4 you can play queen e2 but it's not or queen d3 a queen to any light square but it's not immediately clear like what your follow-up is right why it's not threatening checkmate why it's not um advancing with threats of winning pieces um so it's not yet so clear why this should be amazing for white. But if you play a couple more moves, you'll see that it is quite good for white. So I'm just going to make a couple moves so you can appreciate it. But understand that at this point, it's not so obvious um, that white should go for this. But look, he plays queen check. 
and then when the king moves, he castles. And now suddenly we've got the power of the rook, the queen, and we see that black is hard pressed to organize his rooks and hard pressed to find safe squares to put these pieces on um, since the, you know they're sort of like the queen's tied to defending them, but then as long as she's tied to defending them, she's kind of like pinned, you know, so white's already threatening a move like rook takes d7 and then knight e5 or knight e5 without rook d7. It's very hard to defend this. Um, Black tries to do it with bishop f6 to at least cover knight e5 and take the bishop off an undefended square on e7. So that's logical. But now that gives up this d6 square. And there's no great way to deal with this knight coming into d6. It's threatening to like win this. And it's also threatening to put this king into some really awkward spot. So Navarro made a great defensive decision here and said, I've got to coordinate a little bit. I can let the bishop on b7 go rather than trying to defend the bishop on b7 and not defend his king. And so he plays queen e7 trying to cover the king. If instead, you know, you tried to cover your bishop, uh, then imagine a sequence like knight d6, check, king here, and then look how badly this this king is placed, right? Um, white can play a move like queen c4, starting to threaten queen f7, checkmate. And uh, yeah, black is in a super bad way super quickly on um, you know maybe knight c5 to try and defend this way and then there's a million good moves for white from here but like you know knight h4 threatening knight g6 check with the idea that the bishop takes you also add the rook to the attack um it's just it's just really heinous so if you guys ever have a choice between protecting your king or protecting your bishop you know who to protect queen e7 is played knight d6 check um king moves back and now queen takes queen in order to have time to take this bishop because if you're too excited about taking the bishop well this is never going to happen in a tournament game between gms but you know you got to remember your queen is, is hanging but that's why he's trading the queen he wants to recover his bishop then he'll have a great position and not be down any material what's not to like about that well i think by far the strongest move for white is not to trade queens and actually to keep the attack going although black has tried to cover his king with queen e7 this knight on d6 still seems immensely powerful to me, and I love, from white's perspective, how hard it is for black to coordinate their rooks and sort of sort out the position where the pieces are in front of the king instead of the king being in front of the pieces. So any random just moving away with your queen, I think, is good enough for white to have a good position. For example, you can play queen c2, and there's still this threat hanging over black. Um, and then what I want to play next is either rook takes h7 or rook e1, depending what black does. And I'm going to get a super strong attacking position for white. Um, you know, if black plays knight e5, which is the most sort of like fighting move, then rook to e1, uh, hitting this. And the queen's about to be overloaded defending these pieces. So white's going to win back a piece. You know, between knight e5, f4, and um, knight e5, bishop e5, knight b7, followed by rook e5. White's going to win back the piece anyway. So it'll be very much like the game, except with queens still on the board. And with that king on f8, you're not going to survive sort of a rook and queen type position here as black. I think that's just clinically winning for white. Whereas surprisingly, after white trades queens, it's not going to be that easy to win anymore in this position after white recaptures the piece that they've sacrificed. Because in fact, the knight is weirdly placed on b7. By weirdly, I mean, you know, in danger of just dying. Um, and that's going to help black quite a bit to deal with the fact that his king and rook are still just completely messed up. And, you know, it's not easy to fix it because white always has knight e5 or knight g5. So white plays knight e5, of course, keeping that king stuck in there, going after the weak square on c6. Still weak light squares. Knight d5. So on knight c6, there's rook c8, and it's a little complicated. Like, you can take the knight on d... You can't save the knight on c6. You can take this one. You've won a pawn, but this knight is still trapped, and now black gets the rook out. So I'm not super happy to do it like this for white. I'm down with the move. King b1 first. Rook c8 defends c6. Now knight c6, rook c6, rook d5 would transpose to what we just said. So let's go rook e1. Bringing out the last piece and trying to keep black stuck because black can't bring out his rook. Uh, in this position, Navarro says, you know what? Things are getting, things have gotten out of control for you. Let me give you another chance to win the game. And he goes for this crazy move, bishop a3. I guess he's trapped in and he doesn't know what to do, but I would say g6 or g5 to try and play king g7 at some point. Um, and just stay tough, which is mostly what he does this whole game with exemplary defensive technique is just stay tough. 
But here he plays bishop takes a3. So now there's two different ways to win. One is pawn takes bishop. Surprise. Um, the other is what Navarra did. And we're going to just look at that since both are good enough. He plays knight takes c6. Um, the bishop escapes here, hitting the rook on e1. So he trades, trades, and now he gets the famous seventh rank, right? And you've heard of it. Like, why does the rook go to the seventh rank? Because that's where the pawns are. How do you win a game? Double your rooks on the seventh rank, and your opponent will just be lost. So the rook comes into the seventh rank, and in a moment, white gets the kind of clinical domination. Look at this, stopping rook to e8. That you might expect out of uh, out out of a position just designed for a textbook, right? Boom, second rook. This can barely defended, and it's just total domination. Now, how can you win this? How can you not win this? Both good questions. Um, normally the way to win with this kind of thing would be to either set up a mating net or to broaden the seventh rank first and then set up a mating net. So you would want to bring this knight, um, to either like take on G7 or something or to check on E6, or you'd want to bring this F pawn up to F6. Something like that would be how you would normally go about winning this position. How do you go about losing it? Sometimes you think like every move can win and you don't look at any one move deeply enough and you waffle between seven different ways you could win it and each look pretty good, but you don't look at them in depth and make sure that you figure out all the details. And that's a little bit what happens here. Um, rushing the F pawn is probably good. Knight F5 might be good, but um, there's nothing wrong with what Vidit plays for now. So we'll just wait till he makes a mistake to talk about it. He goes knight e4 with a nice threat of knight f6, which would win this rook because pawn takes knight, rook takes rook. And if not pawn takes knight, then rook f7 would be checkmate at that point. Um, if black tries to play something like this, you can still go check. Oh my god, I'm about to blunder for him. <laughs> this is very instructive, so I'll show it to you. Dump, 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 win the rook, and back rank mate. Okay. So if black goes rook to e8, how would you win? You would actually have to trade on e8 first. It's mildly tricky to see, but very nice. Defends the knight, and if pawn takes knight, defends the rook, and if pawn takes knight, rook takes rook. So knight e4 comes in, threatens knight f6. Rook h6 has to be played to avoid that, and now he's able to get the pawn on g7. Uh, you could have played rook f7 check first before taking it, but it doesn't matter too much because the position is completely winning here and Navarra plays a fantastic defensive move that ends up paying off way more than he could have expected rook to d8 I think um you should always try something in these positions rather than just resigning and uh rook d8 often what you want to do to try and break these up is make this kind of like is take advantage of this kind of tactic that if they take your undefended piece you can take the rook that was being defended by the other one Right, so it's very, um, it's very often the case that you can just sort of like attack one of the rooks with something that seems undefended because they're busy defending each other. That's sort of like your counter tactic to try and get out of things. Now, normally that fails because the rooks can just move out of the way with checks. You know, something like rook to f7 check. Now this guy's not attacked. King here, and um, now we're getting really close to winning. But we need to watch out for the second part of uh, Navarra's defensive tactic which is rook d1 checkmate if i now go knight f6 saying like hey i finished him off rook takes rook takes and at the end eh -eh. so um white needs to take time out now to play b3 to avoid back rank checkmate and now there's just absolutely no move for black to play that defends against knight f6 check and uh white will win the game very easily from here but basically one move away from winning easily, um, Vidit plays the move B3, getting rid of the back rank mate, but maybe just something like playing moves out of order or something. I mean, it's hard to guess exactly why he didn't keep his rooks on the board, but this allows Black to trade off one of his rooks. And I know Vidit's up a pawn, so maybe that could be part of why he wasn't afraid to trade rooks. He's like, I'm on the seventh rank, I'm up a pawn, I can just do whatever. But this is a huge mistake that basically throws away his advantage. Let me tell you what's not equal here. These two rooks, doubled rooks on the seventh, are stronger than the other rooks. That's why it's such a good thing to have them. So if you trade them, like in that rook d8 check king g7 line, then you're giving away your advantage, even if it looks like an equal trade. So he's giving up a huge amount by allowing that trade when he could have checked first and left the black king sort of checkmated and trapped and under attack. Now after this trade... 
Um, basically, he's got to convert an endgame where he doesn't have a mating attack. He's got one extra doubled pawn. And suddenly, Black's pieces are fine in terms of their positioning, right? This knight is sort of limiting his king. This rook is defending all his pawns. And uh, it's very hard. or it's, it's basically impossible to win this endgame for white. He tried for a long time and eventually tried too hard. So I'm going to quickly go through that part of it so you can see the full heartbreak. But um, basically, I mean, he could trade rooks here. He's still got good chances. He's still got some chances to win the endgame if he trades rooks. I think that may be the best chance he had in this endgame to go for the pure knight endgame um, rather than keeping rooks on the board. But you can see that it's not easy for white to make progress here. Black's pieces are in really strong position, right? They're centralized. And now white makes the decision to go into the knight endgame instead of the rook ending. And this is dangerous for white, actually, because he's just promoted this into a protected pass pawn. It immediately advances. And it's clear that although Vidit is still sort of like trying to win the game, he's chasing the ghost of a win that has already left him instead of being realistic about the position he has. So on it goes. Again, he could take a draw here, but refuses with absolutely no justification in the actual position. And then he plays another Howler, giving black protected past pawns, uh, where again, white should just sit still with rook a1, rook a2, and still a draw. But he can't yet admit it. And now black has two connected past pawns, which are better than three isolated past pawns because they can defend each other and they can't be, they can't be fought against. His uh, king and rook can handle these pass pawns, but nothing can handle his pass pawns. Rook g2 to cover this one. C7, king d7 to cover that one. White can, you know, threaten this. White resigned in that position, but he could do all this to get to get him to give up his rook for one of the pass pawns, but then black's going to get two queens himself. So uh, more than enough to win the game. Uh, so, yeah, so... Uh, in this position here, I think White resigned at this point. Um, and yeah, that was the amazing gift that David Navarro, I'm sure, politely apologized to Vidit for, knowing what kind of anguish Vidit would have been in there. Um, so let's just go back for three seconds and try and hammer home one important point about the position with the doubled rooks. This position is as winning as it looked. When you're trying to win this kind of position, what should you not do? Don't do the things that Vita did. Don't trade one of those rooks. Above all, don't trade one of those rooks. Um, don't overlook possible resources from your opponent. You know, Be sure that you looked at moves like rook to d8 because those are your opponent's only shot to get out from under your pieces. And also just be very precise. Pick one variation that you think wins and analyze it carefully. Don't look at four or five different ways to win. Look at one, and if it doesn't work, then look at a second one. Otherwise, just look at that one very carefully. I hope, though I doubt it, that you will go through the rest of your life without a heartbreak like this. Um, but if not, I hope that each time it happens, you will learn a little something and come back stronger. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, good luck to all the players from Prague in the final round tomorrow where Vidit will have to recover from this heartbreak and try and maintain his half-point lead to win the tournament and show his resilience in the face of his first big setback in this event.